Book of Mormon is the strongest document against polygamy. Joseph Smith absolutely did everything he could in his power to fight polygamy. There's a lot of preconceived notions that people have about the Book of Mormon, but when we actually look into it and we find the stuff that it talks about, it's actually very biblical. Even after all you can do, you are saved by grace. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. You want to tell me that's a works-based scripture? Our works are based on our love for God. He is the source of love. So when we love him, it's because he first loved us and it's through his grace that we have to, the desire to love him back and, and love his children in that way. Polygamy is the most prideful doctrine you'll ever find. Polygamy, pride, and prejudice. Yeah, So Joseph ahead. Smith was killed in 1844. Section 132 was added, was it, was it first revealed until 1852, eight years after Joseph Smith's death. She had a huge flood in her home. Her baby was terribly sick, but her husband was at Lagoon with a 16-year-old that he was courting. Hey guys, we're really excited because we just got to do our first interview with Michelle Brady Stone. And we'd been talking with her for a couple of weeks about doing an interview. And then we realized that she just had the small window of time where she was available before she wasn't gonna be available for a while. So um, she fit this into her schedule and there were some miscommunications on our part and we weren't actually sure if we were gonna be able to do it until 10 minutes after our scheduled time. So it was a bit last minute, but Michelle was so gracious and poised and she fit this into her schedule. We were really grateful for that. And she had so many good things to share during this interview. So we're excited to be able to share it with you guys. Um, and her, just her love for Jesus and the Book of Mormon really came through. Michelle is the mother of 13 children whom she has homeschooled. And she's a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And she actually used to believe in the doctrine of the plurality of wives until she started doing some deeper research and she's been uncovering some really amazing things that haven't seen a lot of light. So it's pretty exciting. So she and other people who have been researching into this have been collaborating and she's sharing her findings on her channel, which is 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy. And we just want to be really clear that we're not an anti-polygamy channel. We're not going that direction with this. So a lot has been going on with the discussion of this topic as this new research is coming out and we wanted to address it, but we're still going to be doing our chapter reviews, and really our message is just to get the Book of Mormon out there. That's what we want to be focusing on, and to help people draw closer to Jesus Christ. Whether or not you agree with her or us on everything, she has a lot of good insights to share, and so we're really grateful that she did this interview with us. So without further ado, we're welcoming Michelle Brady Stone onto our channel. Welcome to Book of Mormon Review, where we believe that the Book of Mormon is for everyone. And we're super duper excited for our first interview here with Michelle Brady Stone uh, from her channel, 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy. So welcome, Michelle. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah. So um, today we just wanted to talk about, um, well, like there, there's there's kind of some cross-pollination between our channels because... Um, even though there are tons of different people from different backgrounds, different churches who believe in in the Book of Mormon, um, we all have that in common. And so maybe we have different religious backgrounds or beliefs, but we have in common the Book of Mormon. And so Michelle's channel is really, really cool because she's talking about um, the history of polygamy and um, not only scripturally, but from like a historical perspective from the Bible and the Book of Mormon. And then we're talking about the Book of Mormon and it has a lot to say about polygamy. So um, yeah, I don't, yeah. How, do you, how would you like to start? I think there is, I think there is a really good crossover between our channels. So I'm excited to get to talk to you because I love what, what you guys are doing. My understanding of what you're doing, which is trying to um, sort of like, like make the Book of Mormon be for everyone, right? It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be tied only to a, to one religious organization. Yeah. And what I love so much about that is I feel like, and like, I hope that, you know, the broader Christian audience will listen to this and, and consider some of these ideas. Cause I feel like the Book of Mormon is such beautiful, beautiful gift to, to us. Even if you don't believe it's necessarily divinely inspired, it still is beautiful and profound. Like, I'm so thankful that I've gotten to read Uncle Tom's Cabin multiple times. It's blessed my life, right? So even if you approach the Book of Mormon in that way, it's such a gift. And I feel like it's been really sort of 
gotten a bad reputation and been kind of tainted by some of the false doctrines and false ideas that were brought into the early church led by Brigham Young, the, the church that I'm a member of. Yeah. And, um, and so I feel like it's, it's, if I were the adversary and there were this beautiful book that testified of Christ, what's the best thing I could do? right? Mm -hmm. Make it completely coupled with an organization that practiced a lot of really horrible things. And so, um, so that's why I think this is really useful. My mission is a little bit more specifically to the, to my people, the LDS people and all, and all of the people of my tradition to help them understand that we do have false traditions, that we are not reading our own scriptures honestly and accurately in the way that we should. And then I guess I want to reach out also to the broader community because one thing that I have gotten into this last year that's extremely controversial is the topic of Joseph Smith and whether Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And I'm always asking people to look to that with new eyes because when I started my channel, I thoroughly believed a historical consensus that you just couldn't doubt that Joseph Smith was involved in polygamy and that he started polygamy, right? But I will tell you, as I have looked into it from a critical perspective, that has fallen apart. And I have seen, like, I have become completely convinced, both by study and by faith. It's been confirmed by the Spirit, what I learned through study, that Joseph Smith absolutely did everything he could in his power to fight polygamy. Joseph and Hiram and Emma Smith is someone we really need to learn more about because what that woman did, what she sacrificed, the, her goodness and her faith, and what the church that Brigham Young led said about her and did to, to her and did to her and her husband's legacy is heartbreaking. So I just want to invite everybody to please reconsider what you thought you know. I want my people to reconsider what they thought they know about polygamy. And I want both my people and everybody else to reconsider what you think you know about Joseph and Emma Smith. And I think that's what God wants us to do, right? To get out of our yeah. false traditions, get out of our stick, um, our stiff necked mindsets where we already know everything we need to know and be willing to be like a little child and just come fresh and learn what there is to learn. So that's what I'm, I, I, that's what I'm hoping people will do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I love what you're doing with inspiring people to feel like they can go to God with their questions and they can look at things with new eyes instead of just accepting what they've been told about something. Like that's something that we've encountered a lot as we're trying to share the Book of Mormon with other people is that they've been taught all these false things about it. They have all these misconceptions. And so when we can just open the Book of Mormon and read what it says for itself, we have a lot to learn. And it's so exciting to have have just this freedom in Christ where we where we can come to him with our questions and and be seeking and not uh, not be tied down by what other people how other people think we should interpret things or um, or traditions that we should accept and everything. So I really love what you're doing with that. Yeah, and I liked what you mentioned about uh, uh, I think it was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, how like even it's a great book, you know, and we treat these, these books like that, like they're classics, you know, and we, and we love these books, but then a lot of people treat the book of Mormon as if it's like, you know, like a heresy or something, you know, but I, I was actually it's explaining scary. That. Yeah. It's yeah. evil. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we, it, all these things are attached to that book that aren't actually really part of that book. And so I was actually saying this on one of um, another interview that when we were being interviewed and I was talking about how um, we read like uh, Moby Dick and, you know, that's a class, another classic that we read and it's all about revenge and it's this horrible story and it doesn't have a good, like any morals to it. And we still let our kids read it. And then, um, but then we like, we're terrified. Some people are terrified that their kids will read the book of Mormon because they're afraid that it will, you know, teach them all this false stuff. But then it's actually very much like the Bible. And it actually, it, there's a lot of preconceived notions that people have about the book of Mormon, but when we actually look into it and we find the stuff that it talks about it's actually very biblical it is like like why is it bad to have an, a testament of jesus christ something that testifies of christ mm -hmm. and and even if you think that joseph smith was a brilliant fraud what you know like like i i have yet to see a good explanation for the book of mormon if there wasn't a lot of involvement from the divine because it's hard yeah. to explain right but even if it was the worst case scenario it's a compilation of the best religious thought of joseph smith's day Do you, i mean like there is prof there are profound sermons prof like 
start with King Benjamin's sermon and see what it teaches us about grace and about the lack of our own works. I think that, you know, there's a lot of, um, there are several several verses in the Book of Mormon that I think have some ambiguity that, um, like, for example, Nephi says, for we know that the grace of God is sufficient after all we can do. And, and there's a tendency to interpret that to mean, if we do all we can do, then God's grace will step in. But if you read it in context, you see that it actually means exactly the opposite, that Nephi is saying, the grace of God is what saves you, even with all you can do. That's the grace of God that saves you. And so often when you come to it, and my people have often misunderstood that and so misrepresented it. And I think that's part of what the broader Christian community can do is help us read our own scriptures accurately. Because if you, if, if people not that are not Mormon read our scriptures and then help us, like you can help me do what I'm doing and saying the Book of Mormon, I, I, I always want to pick it up. The Book of Mormon is the strongest document against polygamy. It's the strongest one we have. The Bible does not come close to preaching against polygamy like the Book of Mormon does explicitly, repeatedly, right? That's just mm -hmm. one example. And, and there are many things like that that my people need to understand. And so, and so anyway, and, and that I think that most people would find absolutely beautiful. So like if we can let go of the fear and the anger and sort of the judgment and hatred and instead just look at it with curiosity. I mean, of course, I I, I think all, all godly people try to live by the inspiration of God. So you can just pray about, Lord, is this something I should read? Is this something I should consider for whatever reason? And and I hope that the answer would often be yes, because it is worth reading with fresh eyes, not letting it be so mingled with the traditions, with the Mormon, Utah Mormon traditions. Mm -hmm. that, that's but what, what I think we're both trying to do, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would add just any traditions whatsoever. <laughs> I And I was talking with a friend from another restoration church the other day. And it's just so, it's so nice to get a per different perspective from different people. You know, like the evangelicals we're talking to can offer us fresh perspective and um, people from other, from different restoration backgrounds can offer us fresh perspective. And I, I can't remember, um, where exactly I was, I was going, going with this, but, um, like with the, after all we can do, like some people have pointed out to us that, um, cause that's like a clobber verse that evangelicals like to use, but, um, someone pointed out to us, it doesn't say after we do all we can do, it says after all we can do. And so, and then, yeah. And then you've bringing, been bringing up, um, a lot of good points about what the book of Mormon ha has to say about polygamy and lots of people just assume that it says such and such, but, um, when you read it for what it says itself, then kind of the the scales of tradition, I guess we could call them, kind of start to fall from your, for, from your eyes and you can see what it's saying itself. And so, yeah, yeah, we're excited to talk about that with you. Can I add on to that? You guys tell me if you want me to go a different, if, or if you want to go a different direction, but just a thought I had from that is like, I wanted to give an example for example, the I wish I I I am not always great at remembering chapter chapter and verse. I always need to refresh. But someone could look up um where where it says after all you can do right. And and one of the ways that I think is so useful to approach the scripture again is taught to us in the Book of Mormon. Alma twelve has a beautiful discourse on it. That that there's the greater portion and the lesser portion, right? And I think we find that throughout the Bible. We find the ambiguity, the different possible interpretations. You can interpret different parables in a really self-righteous way, right? Like for example, the lost sheep, that can be about, oh, that one sinner, that one person that was lost, the 99 are all the righteous people and the one is lost. So, we, you know, but if you actually read it in context, you find the 99 are in the wilderness and the one that's lost is actually the one that realizes it's lost. And so mm -hmm. it wakes up, they're all lost. It's just the one that becomes aware of it. Mm -hmm. And that's when the savior comes and picks it up and puts it on its shoulder and his shoulders and carries it home. So the sheep that was lost is at home with the savior rather than in the 99 with the, in, in the wilderness with the 99 who had no need of repentance is what it says, right? So you can read that wow. either way. And, and <clears throat> that interpretation of that story goes right along with King Benjamin's sermon. In fact, it was reading King Benjamin's sermon that opened my mind to that deeper portion of that parable that I think are okay. throughout the Bible, right? And so Alma 12 is where it talks about the greater portion and the lesser portion and the greater portion, we can know more and more of the mysteries of God until we come to know them in full, like the Lord can continue to pour out light and knowledge upon us, or we can be so um, stuck in what we've always known, what we always thought we knew that we 
Lou's light of knowledge, and it's described as eventually we'll be in the chains of hell, right? So we're going one way or the other. And that's why I think there's, so, I, I think that these books, the Bible and the Book of Mormon are such, they're so symbiotic. They help, for me, one helps me understand the other. So the reason I wanted to talk about that, I, I believe in the scriptures often, the Lord gives us enough rope to hang ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We know that in the in the time of the abolitionists and before the, leading up to the Civil War, the Bible was used by both sides. The slave states yeah. absolutely used the Bible to defend their slavery. Yeah. And the free states absolutely used the Bible. It was, it was religious pastors who were leading the abolitionist charge as well. So you can find, so what I think the Lord does is say, here it is, and your, I will allow this to reveal your perception to you. So if I want to use the Bible to defend slavery, I can, right? And I, so I think that's the case with that. Um, we know it is by grace. We are saved after all we can do. If we want to be works-based, we can read it into that. Yeah. But if we want to read what Nephi, I believe, was actually trying to say, and he was saying, even after all you can do, you are saved by grace. That's And if you read it in context where he says, we write of Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, we write according to our prophesies that our children may know to what source they may look for the remission of their sins. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. You want to tell me that's a works-based scripture, right? And so that's what usually happens when we read things in context, we get more light and knowledge. So right. that's mm -hmm. that's why it matters so much. And it, it, I, the that it's second Nephi 25 23 i believe that's the reference and it's no more talking about works than james does uh when james is talking right. about uh works i i can't quote it verbatim but um it, so it, i like what you said about we can read anything into you know something and so like we can all, we can choose to look at it like that in the book of mormon or we can read it in context and actually see what it has to say for itself yep and yeah. i would argue with you i would say that actually the sermon in nephi about about grace because i say that is about grace you know we know that it is by grace we are saved yeah i would say it's a stronger um testament of grace than even in james because because it is making the point of how little our works do to save us Right. right. Our yes. works, I don't want to say they're not important or they're ir irrelevant. They are massively important, right? Because our goal in this life is to take upon us the nature of Christ, to become like Christ as much as we can. And any pain, this is another message that I learned from the Book of Mormon, where it says, if you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me, right? And and um all of all of these messages about there's another, there's another scripture I'm looking for that applies to this, but I'll find it. But but really. If we believe that the Savior suffers all of the pain of mankind, any pain that we cause, we're causing directly to the Savior. And any suffering that we alleviate, we are literally taking off of the Savior's back, right? We, we are helping with the atonement. And so that's why our, our works do matter if we love the Lord. Because if we love the yeah. Lord, we want to take that burden off of the Lord. And we take that burden off of the Lord by our love of our fellow man and trying to take that burden off of them. That's why our, our works matter. Mm -hmm. But in terms of saving us, like, like I think that when we really understand the, the message of the Book of Mormon, which is a testament of Jesus Christ, the message is the grace of God. Then for me, when I started understanding this, and it's all over in the Bible too, like I said, I think that many Christians misinterpret the parables, right? Of, of the savior. When we really understand that the attitude shifts to be like, Lord, thank you so much for taking care of it. Like, thank you for taking care of here is the nature of God. Here is my nature. That's hopeless. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. thank you for making this okay. So that I can just focus on what do you want me to do today? Lord, who can I bless today? How can I help today? And instead of it being about, I'm trying to make sure I'm righteous and earn my own salvation, right? We're supposed to do what the Savior did. The Savior didn't come here to save himself. He didn't come here to appear righteous to others or to be a righteous person. He came here to save all of us, to forget himself and save all of us. So we could, So if we're worried about our own salvation, we're missing the point. What we're supposed to do is go, Jesus, thank you so much for taking care of all of that. Now, how can I help? Mm -hmm. And I think that's Absolutely. the message of the Book of Mormon read correctly. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, true. And I I think that 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 that's so true that um our works are based on our love for God and where does love like He is the source of love so 
when we love him, it's because he first loved us and he put his love and that's an act of grace, you know, his grace working in us. And it's through his grace that we have the the desire to love him back and and love his children in that way. So yeah, it's just beautiful how, and, and the book of Mormon testifies of that so strongly, just like the Bible. So Right, right at the very beginning, right? Lehi's dream that Nephi expounds upon with the the fruit that is white and beautiful and delicious more than any other fruit, which is the love of God, right? And I mean, it, it is it, those messages, like I said, are so symbiotic everywhere. I completely agree with what you said. I, l- I love that scripture. We love it's when we are filled with the love of God, that we are actually able to love God. And then that same love reflects out onto our fellow man. You know, I, I, I who was it that said, um, the love of God never, charity never faileth. That means the charity of God, never, my love can certainly fail. I can certainly fail to have enough charity, but with, but with God's charity, it'll never fail. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So Michelle, I love what you were saying about the love of God, you know, and the, the, the fruit of the, the tree of life is, is the love of God and everything. We've been talking about that a lot in our family, especially, um, from our, our recent, uh, chapter reviews uh, going through Lehi's dream and how it's all leading toward Jesus Christ as and, and him being the fruit of the love of God and the tree of life and everything. Um, and we've been talking about how, you know, that's, that's the whole point of the gospel. The first two commandments are to love God and to love our fellow men as ourselves. Mm-hmm. I feel like that the love of God is the, the, I mean, that's the most basic commandment that Jesus told us to have that guy, that man asked him in Matthew 22, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to love God and your fellow men. And so um, I just agree with you that that's, that's one of the most basic things that we need to have um, mm-hmm. as Christians. Yeah, I think so. And I love, I love combining that in Matthew 22, the first, you know, the great the first commandment is to love God. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that for me, the way, the best way I've found to interpret those, because again, if you combine that with, we love God because he first loved us, Mm -hmm. it's almost a call to experience the love of God. Because I don't know what it means to love God. Like, I don't know how to just love God. Like, 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 do do you know, if you're just, if you're trying to teach your child, love God, like we can say that, you know, but when we understand, when it, it gives us the clue that, we love him because he first loved us. It tells us what it means to be loved, to, to love God. Mm-hmm. It means to be filled with the love of God, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how our, our love is big enough to truly love God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength the way that we're told to. But so that's why I love combining that with Lehi's dream as well. So when we truly are filled with the love of God, we can't help but love God back because it's God's love that we are that we're reflecting back. Mm-hmm. And then that's the same thing. Um, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And I like to interpret that as love your neighbor as you yourself are loved, right? Because we're being filled with the love of God. And then that reflects to God. That's how we love God. And that is how we love our neighbor as mm-hmm. ourselves. It's right. And, and it, for me, it's all telling us the goal of the gospel is that you be filled with the love of God, right? That's mm-hmm. what we are trying to do. So our prayers can be, God, how can I experience more of your love? That, and that's why, that's why, as King Benjamin tells us, we are always um, unprofitable servants. Anything good we do comes because God gave us the love to inspire us and the, the power to empower us to do it, right? And so everything yeah. we do is just like every time I'm blessed to, with an inspiration and an opportunity to serve somebody, it always serves me more. And that's, I'm always like, God, thank you so much. Thank you. You, you, you right for everything yeah. we get to do. And that's really, that's kind of how I've tried to learn to live my life is, am I filled with the love of God? And am I reflecting that onto others? And that's what I try to have my measurement be, because I think it gets so twisted. Those are such simple concepts, but so desperately easy to neglect or misunderstand. Like, like, for example, a a polygamist mindset is extremely works-based, extremely hierarchical and extremely works-based, right? And the commitment Mm -hmm. becomes through these ideas, like polygamy becomes the commitment and we will do anything to defend polygamy, including, I mean, I think you guys have gotten a taste of it, but the way people who love polygamy speak to me and treat me and talk about me and misrepresent me. It's, it's horrible. It's horrific, right? And 
Like, like, I'm sorry, even if you disagree with me, I'm not leading the hordes of Satan to def to destroy all righteousness in the world. I'm not, I mean, I'm right. I'm not like the things that they launch at me. Mm -hmm. And and it does, it's so interesting. I guess I'm kind of going off a little. So interrupt me at any time because I have a lot of ideas. So I'll always just talk. But no, yeah. No. I find it okay. I always say I find it fascinating and and I always just find these additional testimonies of the Book of Mormon and how profound it is. For example, the famous sermon, Jacob 2, I hope people will read it. It's Jacob 2 and 3, and it's beautiful. And it actually combines pride and polygamy. Jacob's heart is heavy because he has to condemn his people for their sins and their abominations. And the first one is pride. And what all and the one the other one that comes with it is polygamy. And those are so linked together. Polygamy is the most prideful doctrine you'll ever find because they always just say well it's only for the very most righteous the very most elect are the only ones that have to live it so if you if you don't like polygamy or if you can't have, you know if you fight against polygamy it's just because you're not righteous enough so you know and and only the people who live polygamy will be exalted and only the people right right it's very a very yeah. prideful doctrine yeah and it removes all love it's like they can treat people in these horrible horrible ways because it's this works-based doctrine and I stand for I stand for Jesus by fighting against the people that I think are wrong which is never which is never what it means our, our the book of mormon is unique in what we take on as our baptismal covenants to mourn with those that mourn comfort those that stand in need of comfort and stand as a witness of god at all times and in all things and in all places and it's too easy to misinterpret that to think that god needs us out telling other people what they're doing wrong and right mm -hmm. standing as a witness mm -hmm. of God means standing as a witness of the love of God, right? right? Are we again Absolutely. filled with the love of God? So we're exuding that. That's the only way we can stand as a witness of God is being filled with the love of God as the first two great commandments tell us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, so I think it is an interesting conversation to understand what those two great commandments mean and how we best fulfill them, embody them and live them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thinking Absolutely. about this love of God, I just it came to mind um, this, the two great commandments that Jesus gave us, those aren't just New Testament things in the old, in the Old Testament. It's especially in like the, the, the five books, uh, the first five books, it's stated all throughout there several times, love that God and love thy neighbor as thyself. I don't, I, I don't know if that, if the second one is as much, but at least love God. It, it says that all the time. And so this isn't like a, a new thing. This is a thing that has been with us for thousands of years. I've just, I've just been noticing recently how the Book of Mormon is full of admonitions, um, and and talking about being filled with love or, um, being full of love. It it uses that that phrase over and over and over again. And I really love what mm -hmm. you're doing, Michelle, because so for those of our viewers who don't come from a restoration background, you know, maybe you're, um, an evangelical Christian or a Catholic or or, you know, we have, we have some Jewish friends. Um, so Michelle comes from, she's a faithful member and active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, which is one of the, the, the churches that be believes in the Book of Mormon. And so what I love about what you're doing, Michelle, is that you're pointing out that there are some traditions, um, you know, maybe that have carried on from early church history um, and, you know, the, that you feel are are you know harmful or or have been destructive su such as polygamy which the book of mormon speaks very clearly about but what you're doing is you're spending your time showing love to others and like like i know we knew that you just came home from from you know serving in your church and and uh you know in, interacting with the other brothers and sisters there and so i think it's really unfortunate like to speak to what you were talking about earlier um the people who attack you and who are um claiming to stand for God's principles and stand for the Book of Mormon and the Bible, but I feel like a lot of their fruits show what you were talking about. Um, like I don't I don't want to attack them or anything back, but show a lot of pride. And um we've noticed that pride and polygamy and we added a the third P prejudice always go together. Oh yeah. Because they're yeah they're a lack of love. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. Because and Jacob calls them out for prejudice in that sermon. That's probably why you added it, right? Is yeah, that, with the Lamanites. Exactly right. Yeah. They become so judgmental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that. Good insight. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> yeah, the, the polygamy, pride, and prejudice.
<laughs> That's and not the Jane Austen good version of Pride and Prejudice, right? The bad version. So. <laughs> No, but yeah, I think I think that it's interesting. I, I so so people who um, I've seen the questions in the Christian world, the Bible based world about polygamy, right? Because there are the like, like it or not, the justifications for Mormon polygamy, early Mormon polygamy grew out of the Bible, right? Because they used Abraham and Jacob and well, doctrine. So just so everyone knows. We have the we have the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants in the LDS Church. You know, a lot of the Restoration branches also have the Doctrine and Covenants, but the versions vary. Um, in the LDS version, we have Section One Thirty Two, which is the one section about polygamy. That's why my podcast is called One Hundred Thirty Two Problems. And so I'll just—is it okay if I just give people a little bit of the background of where I'm coming from and why I have this perspective? Yeah. So go Joseph ahead. Smith was killed in 1844, right? What's interesting, people don't know. Section 132 was added, was it wasn't first revealed, which because I think it wasn't created until 1852, 1852, eight years after Joseph Smith's death. It wasn't added to the Doctrine and Covenants until 1880. So almost the entire history of polygamy, the Doctrine and Covenants actually contained, well, in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, it was section 101. And then in the reprinting of the 1844 Doctrine and Covenants, it was section 109. Both of those were directed by Joseph Smith. He oversaw the compilation and publication of both of those um, versions of the Doctrine and Covenants. He was killed before the 1844 was fully published, but he had overseen the compilation of it. Both of them contain section 101, which adamantly declares that inasmuch as this church has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man shall have but one what one man shall have one wife and one woman but one husband and, and, until the time of death when either is free to marry again, right? He's it states that explicitly. Joseph Smith repeated that throughout his life. He gave an interview in 1838 where someone said, do the Mormons, or he wrote a list of questions and answers that he published in his newspapers and all of the newspapers that said, do the, I don't know if they called them the Mormons. I can't remember which of this one said, but do you believe in plural marriage? And he said, no, and repeated, we do not believe that one man should have but one wife and one woman should have but one husband. He states it explicitly throughout his life. If you look at how many times he fought polygamy tooth and nail. He and his brother Hiram and his wife Emma, who he um, su sustained as the president of the Relief Society, the Women's Organization, which was founded in part to fight against these horrible spiritual wifery practices that were taking part in other groups that some of the missionaries went out and came into contact with. And you know, it's a it's a great deception to tell men, hey, look, God wants you to be polygamist because it feeds every kind of lust, lust for power, lust for glorification lust, and, and, and physical lust, right? So it's an easy sell that was happening in a lot of different communities at that time that also came into the restoration under Joseph Smith. But Joseph Smith did everything in his power to fight against it until he was eventually killed and then Brigham Young was one of these bringing it in. We have journals from them in in England, journals and letters that show them playing with this spiritual wifery doctrine that and and that later became full blown polygamy. So they came to Utah when they were in Utah. They brought out this revelation, right? And it's filled with problems. It has all kinds of internal inaccuracies, scriptural inaccuracies, whatever people want to say about Joseph Smith. He knew the Bible. He used the Bible. He he got it. He's he sometimes paraphrased it, but you can mm -hmm. read in his writings that he knew the Bible. Every one of Joseph's revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants are adamant. It's one man and one wife. I think it's Doctrine and Covenants 42, verse 22, says, mm -hmm. a man shall cleave unto his wife and none else. And it goes on in context. It strengthens what Joseph always taught, right? And so mm -hmm. this is why... Um, this is why this is, I, there was a reason I was going into all of this. Oh, this is, I'll tell you why I was going into all of this. So, so actually Joseph was already fighting the battle that was happening everywhere that people were using the Bible to justify spiritual wifery or plural marriage or polygamy, right? Mm -hmm. And Joseph was already fighting that. And so that's, what's interesting. I think, I think that I've seen people all, still grappling with, well, Abraham was a polygamist and Jacob was a polygamist and David and Solomon were polyg like, right? Polygamy seems to be allowed by God. And that's happening in the Christian community too. And that's what I've really delved into. So I would like to invite the broader audience to 
to visit my channel for these questions because I've studied it so in depth to understand how God absolutely established, always commands, and always only allows marriage between one man and one woman, the establishment of marriage from God, the pattern is set, the commandment is given, the fruits can be seen, and it could not be more clear. And it's very clear in the Bible, more clear in the Book of Mormon. And, and I'm happy to help people see that because yeah. I, I think all of our communities need to understand the sanctity of marriage as God established it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, if, if I can just speak to that, um, I think that's a really important point that you brought up that even if you don't believe in the Book of Mormon, um, I, I would totally endorse M Michelle's channel for exploring these topics more deeply it, it, as far as they, you know, are shown in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, because I think that as Christians, we can, we can often become confused or like even, even people who aren't Christians reading the Bible for the first time or the Book of Mormon for the first time. And uh, being confused because sometimes it seems like, or like people are talking like God will condone or command something that seems against the very nature of God as, as you know, as he reveals himself to be. And so I think it's important to note that just because something is, is recorded in the Bible, because the Bible is a, a history and the Book of Mormon is a history showing us what happened. It doesn't always say that what happened was right. Mm -hmm. And so I think, right. You, the difference uh, between descriptive or proscriptive, right? Prescriptive. Like, is it telling us to do it or is it just describing what they did? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's so interesting because so the book of Mormon clarifies the Bible. I know people might get offended by that, but that's one thing it does for me, right? Like the Bible teaches only marriage between one man and one woman, but then we have the examples of Abraham and, you know, Abraham and Jacob. So interesting that we have Jacob in the Book of Mormon that clarifies and says, nope, only this, and this is why, right? Absolutely. And then 132 comes along and turns that all on its head and undermines. So I just want people to understand that 132 is not in keeping with the Bible, with the rest of, with the actual revelations of Joseph Smith. And I, so I am a little bit out of the, out of the mold of my religion in this way. This is what I'm trying to help my people see. I do not believe that section 132 is of God. I think there are, it's it's a complicated discussion because Joseph did have a true revelation on monogamous marriage that was intermingled and woven into these this false fraudulent revelation, right? And so so I want the broader community to understand that that is a role, like my channel is taken off, which I had no idea a channel on polygamy would become popular, but people are actually interested and hungry for this message. So I, I want the broader community to know if you come and try to use, well, both Mormon people in my church, I know we call ourselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My mom wrote the song, I'm a Mormon, and I just don't like word games. I've, I've always been a Mormon, so I call myself a Mormon. But <laughs> So for Mormons, we need to stop trying to defend section 132 because it is false doctrine and it makes, it keeps people away from the Book of Mormon, which is not our goal, right? Mm -hmm. And then for people outside of the church, please don't think that 132 is an accurate representation of the Book of Mormon or even of my people, right? We just mm -hmm. don't know yet. And, and that's what many of us are trying to do this work. So yeah, so I was just going to use the example, like Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, in the very first verse, it says that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were polygamists. Isaac was never a polygamist. It's like right from the beginning. It also says there's the doctrine of um, plural wives and concubines. What would the doctrine of concubines be? What a horrible <laughs> thing to claim, right? Then it goes on and it claims that God commanded Abraham's polygamy. God commanded Isaac's Isaac's polygamy, commanded Jacob's polygamy. It claims that Moses was a polygamist. No, I've, I've done episodes on all of these things. I've looked into them very deeply, right? And so so that's what I, I want to say is the Book of Mormon clarifies the Bible in these accurate and beautiful ways. The Doctrine and Covenants contradicts the Bible in these terrible ways that none of the rest of the, doc of the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine and Covenants does in anything like the same way. So, so I just wanted to clarify that, that the ambiguity or tricky things in the Bible, the spirit of polygamy that's just so awful and prideful, it makes any ambiguity in the Bible worse, the worst version of it, right? Where the Book of Mormon does the exact opposite. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and um, you said before you were talking about how polygamy, um, we, we talk often about how polygamy harms women. And 
I don't think we think as much about how polygamy harms men. You were you were talking about the lust that that is is fed through polygamy. I'm in a previous episode. You were talking about, um, or or maybe maybe it was on our call with you uh, about a week ago. You were talking about the physiological change that happens when you know when a man gets married and settles down and has children. But um, like, do you want to talk about that again? Explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do have Versus an episode polygamy. where I talk about this and I bring it up in, in many other places too. And I have a lot of episodes now. So it's, you know, but I, I have a website. So if people want to search transcripts, they can try to find where I talk about things because they're quite long. But um, I was fascinated when I studied brain chemistry as it applies to these topics. And I'm still looking for, there, not as much work has been done on women because women are often a little bit forgotten. You know, I want to also know about the brain chemistry of women in monogamy versus polygamy. I have some strong predictions of what that would do. But for men, this is really interesting to me. And I won't have the studies right now to link them, but they are linked in my episodes where I talk about it. But um, um, when a man gets married, when a man is single and kind of, especially like a moral Christian man, I shouldn't say especially, but you know, like, like hopefully we, many of us believe in being moral and being celibate until marriage. Right. And so, but it's probably even worse when men are not, don't, don't follow those biblical standards. But when a man is single and looking for a mate, looking for a spouse, his testosterone is very high because it's this I, I, this, I'm not saying this in a negative way. It's not a bad thing, but it's kind of a vying for status. It's kind of like a, I need to get the girl. I need to impress the girl. I need to, do, do, do you know what I mean? It's a very testosterone led approach to life, right? Which makes complete sense. And it's just, it's how God established it. It's how it should be. When a man is married, his testosterone lowers and his oxytocin raises. I hope I'm getting this right. If I'm misremembering anything, someone can correct me. This is how I remember it at least. And his testosterone is that vying for power on the prowl. I'm hunting. I'm right. I'm trying to um, accomplish. What's the word I'm looking for? I'm, I'm conquest, right? It's about conquest. Mm -hmm. But oxytocin is about bonding. It's about, it's what a mother releases when she gives birth, after she gives birth. And every time she, she breastfeeds her baby, right? So oxytocin is about the bonding. And that's how a man's brain chemistry changes when he's married, which is exactly how it should be and beautiful. And then when that couple have a baby, it happens again. His testosterone lowers again and his oxytocin and something else rises again because now he's even more bonded and those bonds to his children. So married monogamous men, their brains actually reflect that. And I'm sure it's true in all of their physiology, but it is definitely true in their brain chemistry. It changes the actual way they think, the way they engage, the way that they feel in their lives. And so that training of monogamy is essential for men. And I think that for me, one of the clearest cases to see this is King David. Well, so I should say this, in polygamy, a man is never out of the hunt. Mm -hmm. He's never off the prowl. He's never out of the status seeking and this trying to date and trying to, you know, I just, again, heard an awful story about a woman who, she had a huge flood in her home. Her baby was terribly sick. She, you know, all of these things happened, but her husband was at Lagoon with a 16 year old that he was courting, right? Like, like it's a different type of, it's a different way to be a man. Mm -hmm. If you are a monogamous man or a polygamous man, I have a sister who worked there. There are a lot of polygamous in construction. She worked in construction for a little while as a secretary. And she would see the married men there flirting with, you know, like, think of that. The married men are always still flirting. They're always on the prowl. So they never receive the benefit of that lower testosterone and that higher oxytocin. They never get that pair bond. So if mm -hmm. you apply this yeah. to David, you know, David was up on the roof. I, in my interpretation, watching the mikvah, which is the Jewish ritual bath that the women would do right, right at the time of their fertility. Why was he on the roof watching the mikvah, right? David never, he, his testosterone stayed high. He was always in the prowl. And that's why I think, see, polygamists also misunderstand so badly the scripture. Is it 2 Samuel 8, 12? That might be it. That might not. But where um, it says that Nathan said that like, God, according to God, I gave you your throne and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives. So polygamists use that to say, see, God gave David his wives. He wants them to have them. That's not what he's saying at all. He's teaching us a powerful sermon on lust. He's saying, look how much God has given you. Look how much God gave you. And it still is never enough. 
because mm-hmm. I always say this, I said it in that episode, you know, lust is a, fi- is a fire that burns brighter the more it's fed. That The more you feed your lust, the worse your lust will be. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that's so important to understand is that like, like polygamy takes men, it turns men who would be good men into something very different mm-hmm. than they yeah. would have. They might've been just wonderful fathers and husbands and it turns them into men who just don't have the brain chemistry who care about their wives and children the way they otherwise could. And and I I, I want to clarify, like polygamy is also a problem. Another way you can see the fruits, like a man with two wives is not the same as a man with 10 wives or a man with 30 wives, right? The, the more of it you have, the worse you become, yeah. which is the yeah. opposite of the commandments of God, mm-hmm. right? Yes. It, and like, I remember- like the, the, the more successful you are, because another thing that we need to look at is how God established it with mothers and fathers for children, right? Like that's how it's supposed to be. A mother and a father raising their children. The more successful a man is in polygamy, the less of a father he is. Mm -hmm. Like there are so many stories of these polygamous men and they're like telling the the kids to go home. They think they're the neighbor kids and they don't even know their own children often in these big, big, like with the leaders in polygamous groups. So it it destroys everything that God established. You have fatherless children. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know yeah. that for a lot of people, the way, the way we see our father, our earthly father affects how we see our heavenly father. And so if people have a father who's not, not there for them or who's emotionally unavailable or who just isn't around or who is abusive, then we project that image of our earthly father onto our heavenly father and, you know, think that he's not emotionally there or he, um, or he's abusive and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. That's, no, not that that's all exactly men right. are abusive, I, but, but they're not, no, the, be but the there system for, is, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, the system is because I, that's why I also talk about it being a self-perpetuating system, right? Like we know from all of the studies that have been done that children that are not connected to their father act out in different ways. And it's almost perfectly designed to make polygamy just this downward spiral where boys who are raised without an involved father tend to act out more, Right. And polygamists need to get rid of the boys. So back in the days of King Darius and the old polygamists, they would have eunuchs. That's how they would get rid of the extra men, right? Or they would have a war. Polygamous colonies can't do that. Polygamous groups can't do that now. Or, you know, I I don't, I, it's so hard to be in this space because I actually love people. I have known polygamous people. Like I used to be in, in, in homes of polygamous people that have so much respect and admiration for them. So this is not a personal criticism yeah, of the people. Absolutely. I know they won't be able to hear that. I'm just talking about the system that God wants to save us from, right? Like bad ideas, bear broad fruit. So I'm not attacking any people, just a system. But yeah. So you have fatherless boys who act out and so are kicked out, right? And fatherless girls tend to act out sexually, and they're often looking for the love of a father in their sexual partner. So you have these girls that are going to be married off to older men who they see as a father figure, the imbalance, right? And and then, yes, yeah. and it is very much in polygamy, like Brigham Young. The problem is, is that polygamists still believe Brigham Young's doctrines. Polygamists are the most racist people you'll ever meet because they still believe Brigham's terrible teachings of racism. Where again, Joseph taught exactly the opposite. Joseph Smith Mm -hmm. ordained black men to the priesthood, right? It was that came from Brigham Young. Yeah. And they hold to so they really are the church of Brigham Young, not the church of Jesus Christ, as restored by Joseph Smith, right? But Mm -hmm. so all of these bad ideas, another bad idea of Brigham Young is this idea of sort of men being gods, right? So he really taught, I'm the God that you need to look to. So that's, so when you're reading through Brigham Young's sermons and he's talking about obedience to God or the early leaders, in so many ways, they meant obedience to us, right? Mm. And so that, those, those, like being raised in polygamy, you are not only just thinking of God as your father, because that's what we tend to do. They're actively taught that. They're actively taught that God is a polygamous man. And I represent God and, and the only way you have to access God is through me. So you better obey what I do because obedience to me is obedience to God, right? And so yeah. that's why it's so important to help people um, rid themselves of these these terrible, terrible false doctors, these just evil, evil ideas that that we need to be free from. Absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. And I was um, I remember where I was going with the the whole polygamy is bad for men men too because 
Um, I think it's really interesting that the Book of Mormon connects, you know, earlier we were talking about the love of God and, and how much the Book of Mormon speaks to that. And then we're, we're talking about this, this polygamy and, and the lust that it creates in men who, who want to, you know, probably want to be, want to be good and, and following God. And in Alma 38, 12, um, Alma is counseling his son Shiblon and he says, bridle all your passions, you know, the lust that ye may be filled with love. So the, the whole yes. point of, the, of this is nurturing love and protecting love. And it, it's, it's not just like, I feel like a lot of people see God's commandments as saying like, don't do this or, and don't do that. Yeah. But really it's, it's that in order to protect this good and beautiful thing, then we have to understand the, the dangers of, of this other thing that, that is going to corrupt that. I completely agree. I think the best way to see the God, God's commandments is to see a mother's rule. A mother says, don't go in the street to her children, right? God's commandments are not to judge us. They're to help us. Men are that they might have joy, right? And and that's that's a, a Book of Mormon teaching. And that's what we believe, at least what we, if we see it, I think most purely as taught, then we see God's commandments, not as thou shalt not or else, right? But we see them as if you want to, gain the very most growth. And if you want this life to be your opportunity to become as much like me as possible, which is why we believe we're here, then these are the ways you can do that. And that's why the love of God and the love of man is such an important commandment and why it's so easily misunderstood because bad ideas skew it in terrible ways. So it can be, if I really want to be obedient to God and be like God, I need to be as completely embedded in this polygamous doctrine as possible, right? I need to fight against anybody who says that I need, if, if I'm the women and the girls, I need to be silent and keep sweet and squash all my feelings, which always comes out in these really toxic ways, right? If I'm a man, I need to get more wives. And it does, it kills love. It's I like, I've seen shirts before that say porn kills love. I've wanted to make shirts that say polygamy kills love mm -hmm. because it really does. Like, like I said, I mean, you can read so many books of our polygamous ancestors and you just see how a man who could have loved a wife and his family becomes something so different where he can't even see the suffering. Can't even, like like Brigham gives so many sermons, Brigham Young, and he gives one sermon that, well, I, I could think of a million, but, but one that comes to mind is when he talks about the incessant whining of his wives and he's threatening, I'm going to give you two weeks. And if you don't stop this incessant whining, then it, like he can't see that his wife, like this should be, a man should care if his wife is in pain, right? And instead, all he can see is how much, how annoying it is that he has to be around people experiencing pain. Stop that already. Right. And that's where the keep sweet doctrine comes from. So that's why it really mm -hmm. is like you cannot keep those two great commandments if you are so trapped in false traditions that it blocks it all out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and we want to be clear that when when we're when we're talking about Brigham Young or other leaders of the LDS church, and, and I, I know it's the same for you, Michelle, we're not trying to tear anyone's tear anyone's faith down or, or criticize their religion or anything. Um, but like you were talking about the, um, you know, Brigham's attitude toward, the, toward those wives. And it really seemed, it, it seems sad to me reading that quote um, because Jacob in, in chapter two, he's talking about how the Lord loves the tender and chaste feelings of, you know, of, of, of women and, and he wants to protect that. And it seems to me that those um, complaints might be coming from, you know, a, a, a someone who's, who's tender and, and chaste and is in this system that is ob abusing those feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's okay. So it like feeling powerless in your marriage is an incredibly painful, painful feeling in any marriage, right? Polygamy exacerbates that exponentially. The women have to compete for, you know, just like everything is a hierarchy. Who's the favorite wife? Who's the obedient one? If if you have, and like, that's what I, when I realized how, because I, I I grew up believing polygamy was going to be a beautiful thing. And it was the law of Zion and the celestial kingdom. And my grandmother was raised as the oldest daughter of polygamist. And I just heard stories, you know, so I, I was incredibly naive because I didn't understand that it's the power differential that creates so much problem. If you have a challenge with your husband, you need to be able to talk it out, work it out. Because 
Yeah. Because marriage is hard, right? It's heartbreaking. And you try really hard because you love each other and you're equally yoked as we're supposed to be, equally yoked with the Savior, but equally yoked with our spouse as well, right? In polygamy, you lose any ability to have to to do that mm -hmm. you don't even yeah. get to bring up issues with your husband right like you can read some of the stories of women who would actually have children die because they couldn't advocate for what for the needs of their families right mm -hmm. and and so it's it like goes so much deeper and so the very reason that god gives us in Sir jacob's sermon the, in in chapters three two and three the very reason that god put um completely condemns and forbids polygamy is because of what it does to the women. You have broken the ten, the hearts of your wives and your children, right? It talks about that. Many hearts died pierced with deep wounds that like it goes on and on. People like to take verse, oh, Jacob 2.30, right? Like they totally mis, um, misrepresent what it says and take it out of context. It says, for if I will say that the Lord of hosts raise up seed unto me, I will command my people. Otherwise they shall hearken to these things. And I've done that whole exposition of it many times of how they have to take it completely out of context, change words to completely turn around in its head to say it says the exact opposite. Verse 31 says, for I, oh, I can't remember. Maybe we need to look it up, but it goes wrong. Right. It's embarrassing that I'm forgetting it because I have it so memorized. Here it is. Um, let's see. For behold, for behold, I, the Lord, have seen the sorrow and heard the mourning of the daughters of my people in the land of Jerusalem, yea, and in all the lands of my people because of the wickedness and abominations of their husband. And it's talking explicitly about polygamy. Polygamy is the wickedness and abomination, right? And I will not suffer, saith the Lord of hosts, that, this pe um, that the cries of the fair daughters of this people, which I have led out of the land of Jerusalem because they were practicing polygamy, um, that they shall come up unto me against the, the men of my people, saith the Lord of hosts, for they shall not lead away captive the daughters of my people because of their tenderness, save I shall visit them with a sore curse. Interesting how cursed early Utah was while they were living polygamy, all kinds of plagues and poverty and seal, I mean, I, like uh, um, all kinds of horrible things, droughts and famines happened again and again and again until they let go of this doctrine, right? Um, at, at least the practice of it. We still need to let go of the actual doctrine itself, but we've let go of the practice of it. Um, even unto destruction, which is exactly what Wilford Woodruff said when he had the revelation that he had to end polygamy. He said, this church will be completely destroyed if we don't stop this, right? That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. All of this is a fulfillment. Brigham's sermon, everything that happened is fulfillment. The prophecies in the Book of Mormon, but we refuse the scales of darkness on our eyes, which the Book of Mormon tells us about, because we are so choked by the traditions of our fathers, make it impossible for us to see what it actually says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it goes on, I will visit them with destruction, for they shall not commit whoredoms like unto them of old, saith the Lord of hosts. And anyway, it goes on the whole thing. Behold, you have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites. This is the prejudice part. Mm -hmm. um, you have broken the, the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children because of your bad examples before them. And the sobbings of their hearts ascend up unto God against you. That's the whining Brigham is talking about. God cares about the tears, the suffering of powerless women and children in these in this horrible system, right? And and Brigham could only see, he couldn't even connect it to this, right? I don't know if he even read this. He just saw it as incessant whining and and condemned it and told, told them it better stop, right? And and it goes on and on and on. They're told this so often. People that would come to Utah would be shocked to see that on these muddy, they had these muddy um canals going down the side of the street and plinks over them. And when they went to cross a bridge, the men would kind of push their way in front of the women and expect to always go first while the women would have holding their ch children would wait and go second, which was so contrary to the culture in the rest of the nation where men would open doors for women and write the chivalry. But they were actively taught repeatedly that men comes first. Men is men is the head and woman's in the rear. Right. And mm -hmm. that's uh, like I found a sermon that explained to me that that's why in our church we say brothers and sisters where the rest of the world says ladies and gentlemen. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a cultural like we don't realize all the ways that this has come down to continue to affect us that mm -hmm. really would be good to be to be. That's why I'm trying to investigate them out so we can rethink all of them. I don't think we need to stop saying brothers and sisters, but we should at least be cognizant of yeah. what that attitude is. And if we really want to keep these ideas in our back pocket, we, like the idea that 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 there might be polygamy in heaven. The idea that a man can be sealed to two women in the temple, but a woman can't be sealed to two men. And, you know, like 
they just they just are not good things to have hanging around. You don't you don't yeah. want to like keep abomination. You don't want to keep comfortable with abomination, right? We don't want to be like, yeah, I'm just holding out that abomination card because someday God could command this abomination. <laughs> Why? Why would we want to do yeah. that? Yeah. And I've I've heard that there's talk of it possibly coming back and that people you know some people are getting ready for that. Um even I I I I know of some people who uh teach their daughters that they when they're you know dating someone they should only date or or court um whatever whatever they're doing someone who is willing to practice polygamy because they're expecting it to come back and i i feel like that's a very dangerous thing to to teach your daughters like yeah from 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 the get go and 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 for for a young man to be be thinking of um like the possibility i, I don't know i feel like it just destroys faithfulness and trust It does. It destroys faithfulness and trust. And it really does destroy love because when you're married, God wants us to be one. God wants us to cleave and be one, right? Like that commandment, if you are not one, you are not mine is for all of us, but most of all for a married couple, right? What God has put together, let no man pull pull us under. We want to be one with our spouse. So everything from God should turn our hearts toward our spouse. And when we're struggling, hopefully the answers, you know, so many times I'm on my knees, like it, you know, when, when, when marriage is hard and, and I'm, I've been on my knees being like, Lord, please help me to see my husband the way you see him. Please help him to see me the way you see me, right? Like you are trying to turn your heart to your spouse, mm-hmm. but in polygamy, it does the opposite because one of another, one of Brigham Young's doctrines he's taught, taught was called, I, well, I call it, I call it trading up because he taught if a woman could find a man with higher priesthood, and he would be willing to take her, she could marry him instead, right? And so women can keep it in their mind often. Like, first of all, women can often have this like insecurity that this beautiful connection they have with this husband, or at least this equality can be undermined and destroyed either in this life or the next. You know, there are so many stories of of women whose husband dies and they are so like older women who are so afraid that he's already got another wife or they're afraid to die because their husband will marry somebody else. And, you know, like it's, not a good yeah. thing to do to women, right? But then there are also women who feel like, uh, yeah, my husband's not that great, but I'm going to be sealed to someone awesome in the next life, right? That's that for yeah. people who really are, even who are in the church, but who love, who keep polygamy close to the heart. These are easy doctrines to have. And then on the other side, obviously, you know, when men are like, oh, I wonder, I mean, I mean, this will sound really crass. And I don't mean it to be, and I'm not claiming that this is all men, but course with young men you know like ooh, maybe I could have a blonde brunette and a redhead for my wife you know what I mean like like just these ideas that are that are there and then also like I talked to a friend who has learned the truth of polygamy and shared with me that like in his struggles in his marriage he would sometimes feel like I wonder if at some point I could have a wife who loves me like maybe one of my wives will do you know like whatever you see lacking in your spouse you can imagine that it will be there in another spouse. And it sometimes is said explicitly by people promoting the doctrine of polygamy, even if they're LDS. Like, let me make it clear. LDS people, Mormons do not live polygamy. Like you may not live polygamy in the LDS church. You will be excommunicated. We don't even talk about it very often, but it's this uncomfortable, it's this elephant in the room, right? It's this thing under the rug that could come out and get us anytime. Right. So, and so it's there in people's mindset often. So for men, again, with both of those things, it turns their hearts away from their spouse. A woman can feel, I have this marriage, but it can be threatened at any time. Or my husband's not that great. I'm going to have a better husband at some point. Right. And then men can feel like, okay, yeah, she has these problems, but there's going to be someone else or, Ooh, who might, 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 might their wives be. It just destroys everything that is beautiful in what God established. Well, and yeah. that's the part where in Jacob three, where the, where Jacob talks about the Lamanites and these they're wicked people, but he's still like their husbands love their wives and their lives what their wives love their children and their children love their parents. And so that that's an interesting part right there. I think that's a really important important part right there because he's talking about these other wicked people. They're still wicked, but they still have the basics of marriage down and. They're loving yeah. each other as they should be instead of going around and um, lustfully seeking after other wives to add to your harem. 
they haven't embraced this abomination, mm -hmm. right? That, and it's yeah. and, and let me be clear, it's the abomination that's the problem. It's the idea that this is of God. That's the problem because there are, like, I want to say again, like I know that there are so many pure hearted, good people in these polygamous traditions who just want, who want nothing more than to love God and love their fellow men and serve God and do what God wants them to do. That's often the, the, the commitment to it is because they think it's what God requires of them. And that's why I'm trying to do what I'm doing because all of that righteous desire is being, you know, it's kind of like Satan has created this, this dam that, that takes all of this righteous desire out from flowing to the tree of life, like out from flowing unto eternal righteousness and the, um, the living waters and has twisted it into this just abominable loop of mm -hmm. darkness that just will create more and more and more misery. That really is by their fruit. She shall know that like polygamy kills love and creates misery and creates separation from God. Cause you're always having to earn your, your validity in every possible way. You know, you're never good enough. You're never righteous enough. Yeah. Or you're so righteous that you're on the top and you're the best one of all, right? It's this hierarchy where you're always judged that way, where God, I think, does the ex exact opposite and wants us all to see one another just through eyes of love and charity, not through eyes of judgment and rank. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like um, Jesus is himself. He's the perfect example that he, uh, you know, like in, in polygamy, there tends to be this, uh, like the you know, the control over the many by, by the few or, um, and, and that goes down to the, you know, the husband and wives relationship, you know, the, the husband is, is, is the say on everything. And then the wives just have to obey. But Jesus is the example of he, like he came to serve, not to be served. That's what the Bible says. Right. And, and then he's teaching the bride to, you know, to serve, to serve Christ back, um, by serving each other. It's, it's this, um, th this outward, you know, like looking to, uh, to right. love he who is the greatest among you be the low, be the servant of all, right? Yes. Like he who exalts himself shall be abased and he who abased himself shall be exalted. And Jesus as the master did the lowliest job of the entire society by washing the disciples feet. Right. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that in polygamy, women in the FLDS group, at least, would keep their hair very long because it was to wash their husband's feet one day, right? I would love to see, for example, polygamous men wash the feet of their wives and their children instead of the opposite. That's what Christ that was would doing. Be, that would be living that example. But I think to yeah. many of them, that's an appalling thought. And yet to not even be able to see that mm -hmm. is is just stunning how blind how like I, I I say in a rude way like polygamy makes people stupider, <laughs> but I mean I mean it really does. Believing in this makes you read words and claim they say the exact opposite of what they say, and makes you you know like like the arguments that that I have encountered as I'm engaged with people defending polygamy. I'm like, do you realize how much like like truly it is? You are losing light and truth and becoming darker and darker and darker in your mind, right? To the point that you can't even see that Jesus, who you're comparing yourself to was the servant of all. He came to serve. He gave everything to serve others. He washed his disciples' feet and he allowed himself to be hung on a cross, crucified, right? That Absolutely. is not what Brigham Young did. That is not what polygamous men do at all. Yeah, like um, I, I, I've just noticed, I, I was talking with a friend the other day how a lot of... Um, again, I'm not trying to attack the LDS church, but like a lot of the doctrines that came specifically from Brigham um, created legalism in, in the church. And it, it's created, uh, I feel like for many people, it created this, this different concept of God, you know, a God who would, uh, who wanted to, um, th th you know, like throw a javelin through someone who- Well, and even them. worse, a God who- a God who does not care about your feelings and your experience. A God who, like, like even now, polygamy, polygamy defenders, people who defend polygamy, say it doesn't matter if it's hard. If God commands it, it doesn't matter if it causes su suffering. Whatever God commands. So it's mm -hmm. a God who commands suffering. Like, like I've said, you know, Genghis Khan was a polygamist, right? But Mormon polygamy is worse because Darius and Genghis Khan and the other 
polygamists just did it because they could. They had the most power, so they could. But in in religious polygamy, it gets turned into God requires this. God demands this. It's and celestial or divine. Ever. It's for, yeah. So, yeah. so it's not just that I am ex- exercising unrighteous dominion, which it absolutely is because the doctrine of covenants also section 101 calls out unrighteous dominion. Again, the blindness is shocking, but it's not just that I'm exercising unrighteous dominion. It is that God is this domineering like like monster that does not care how much suffering he I inflict on you because he's telling me to do it right like you better sit down don't feel your your like like women are taught that their very feelings are sinful like yeah. always in polygamy the women talk about I need to overcome my jealousy it's like you need to overcome like that's like saying I need to overcome my desire for water I need to overcome my thirst right mm-hmm. that is how God created you and what you need. And so they say that while men never need to overcome their lust, like Orson Pratt's that 1852 conference where they first revealed what became section 132, Orson Pratt gave as one of the reasons for polygamy, for we have got a human nature to grapple with. And he, like he's going on saying, how are we going to, going to avoid having houses of prostitution and all, and all of this adultery? Well, of course, God gave it to his most righteous service to have a plurality of wives. Are you kidding me? Like, and so often with polygamous men, well, polygamous in general, they don't know that there's such a thing as a righteous monogamous man because they always say, Well, do you want polygamy or do you want adultery? Do you want polygamy or do you want prostitution? I'm like, those aren't the only two choices. <laughs> and really, it's the same choice. Polygamy yeah. is prostitution, saying that the that the women that they had to have polygamy so the widows could be taken care of, which first of all is not true, and they were marrying fourteen year olds far more often than they were marrying widows. But in addition, if you tell a widow she has to marry you in order to be provided for, when Jesus says take care of the orphans and the widows, mm-hmm. you are engaging in prostitution. And and in the Book of Mormon, we even have a story, King Limhi, there were many widows because they had lost many wars. King Limhi did not institute polygamy to take care of the widows. King Limhi asked the living men to take to provide for more than just their own family, right? Like yeah. every every argument about polygamy is just atrocious. And there was a point I was making, but I lost it. So you guys can remind me or go on from there. Okay. Oh well, I I was just thinking, um, it, like I hope, like hopefully it'll this will give you time to remember that. But um, I was just thinking about that example that you gave with Limhi. It, again, it's the it's not the men, you know, taking these women. Uh, it's the men as as the example of Christ, you know, the bridegroom taking care of the of of the other women and the and the uh, the bride selflessly. You know, when there when there's nothing for them to gain from it. Right. Just purely following the admonition of Christ to care for the widows and the orphans, right? Care for the poor. That's our obligation and our responsibility. If you demand marriage in exchange, that's not charity. It's prostitution, right? And that's why Jacob calls it whoredoms. That is what it becomes. And, you know, by our standard, like Brigham Young was absolutely engaged in child trafficking and human trafficking and like the way that he ran it, we would call it that today, how he would just uh, like my great, great grandmother as a barely 17 year old was assigned to a 40 year old man over conference. He said, have you got Anson call? Have you got a wife? There's Maria Bowen, take her. She had to leave her mother go. And, and she was, her father had died crossing the plains. It was so often the unprotected girls. Right. Mm-hmm. And she, her story is heartbreaking. She like, like no one wanted this marriage, right? She ended up having six children. She lost a couple of them because of the situations that she was left in in part, right? Oh, and then God. finally, she was kicked out. Like, the, like, like for whatever reason, he decided to divorce her. And he and the other wives kept the children and kicked her out. She only was allowed to take her nursing new her nursing newborn baby. She had to make her own way from Bountiful to Spanish Fork for, for people not in Utah. That's like mm-hmm. across two state counties, right? To try to find where or three, three counties to to go live with her mother who'd been given to another man as well, right? And then when that baby had grown up a, a little bit, they sent her oldest son to take the baby back to the colony. All of her children were taken away from her. My great grand, my great, great grandfather was her three-year-old when she was kicked out. I don't know if he even ever saw her again, 
right? Yeah. And so, like, wow. they're horrible, horrible, horrible stories mm -hmm. of what wow. of what happened. When yeah, it is not. It it does kill love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, and um, I was just I was thinking about you know the example of the I I think it's so sad those people who are are attacking you because as as we've been watch your channel and and engage with you it I I don't get the sense that you're trying to um uh, to tear down celestial principles or anything um you I feel like you're really genuine in in trying to share you know tr and protect tr love as it's found in the scriptures and and as as it comes from God and I think um I think like going back to what we were talking about with how um, some of these traditions, including polygamy, can change our concept of God when when God would com command something that causes such suffering and, and you know just just problems like that. Um, I feel like maybe for these people, the, they see God that way, and so that by definition, that is good, and so that's how they treat other people um, with these. Uh, I, I guess I'd call them Brighamite um, tendencies and 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 things like that. Tactics, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Yeah, it just, it twists everything. It makes woe unto those who call good evil and evil good. I, I butchered that, but right, that's that's what it does. It twists it all on its head. It's the most perfect deception that the adversary could come up with. One of the most perfect deceptions. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, and, and I, I've said, I like one thing that we had talked about in the past as well is that as members of the church, we want to stand up for families. We are known as the church of families. We want to believe in families, right? Yeah. And we have our pet, our pet abomination that we keep, that we keep saying, well, you know, they, they, God commanded it. God wanted it. As long as we keep claiming that God commands abomination, we cannot, without hypocrisy, stand for families. We cannot teach the good in the, like, we have to cleanse the inner vessel. We have to take the beam out of our own eye before we can get the milk out of our neighbor's eye regarding marriage as God established mm -hmm. it. So that's why I think, I, I mean, and our responsibility is always to love one another and really recognize when people have difficult circumstances. If you are in a circumstance that is not amenable to traditional marriage, for example, if you are in a polygamous marriage, I, I hope that people can hear me say this, like, I love you and I want to love you. And I, and I understand with so much compassion, how hard it would be to be in that situation and then become aware of some of these things. Yeah. All we can do is pray to God to know what's the best thing to do. Like how, how do I best navigate this? Right. And the same yeah. thing with speaking of marriage for people who are gay, who struggle with um, same sex attraction. I think in our church, we do not have answers for that. We do not have adequate answers for that in the LDS church or in Christianity in, in general. Yeah. And just telling people they're evil is not the answer. Again, that's the wrong thing. So again, with like everybody who struggles in any way to fit in easily to marriage as God established it, God loves you perfectly. God made you perfectly. I, if I am doing God's, um, if I am in keeping with God, if I'm filled with the love of God, I love you with the love of God, right? It is never our place to judge and condemn others. Mm -hmm. So I'm not yeah. talking about condemning people in any of these groups. I want to just talk about the ideas and, mm -hmm. and promote marriage as God established it with like, like I would absolutely love to have polygamists over in my home. I would love to have a gay couple over in my home. I, you know, like it's not about condemning the people just about talking about the ideas and the best way to navigate um what like like anyone who's in one of these difficult situations the best we can do is say god how do you want me to navigate this and yeah. for those of us who aren't our job is to go god thank you for making my path easier how can i best love the people who have a harder path how can i mm -hmm. best show forth pure love to them so anyway there's Absolutely. my little soapbox on that topic <laughs> but. well right. yeah and going going back to that that you know the first two commandments to love god and to love our fellow men as ourselves and i've never been able to find a verse in in the bible or the book of mormon that qualifies that second second commandment like love love them as long as they're obeying the commandments or love them if they meet this these criteria you know it says love your neighbor as yourself so if my neighbor like like you were saying um i mean i i grew up 
not really knowing how to how to deal with people who are in the LGBTQ community since you brought that up. And I know you have you have two daughters who are in that community themselves. Actually, yep. mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And um mm -hmm. we, you know, we sometimes we feel or or in our understanding to love is to bash on them or but something I've come to real realize recently is that there's just they're just the same as us. They just have different sins than we like all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We just we just have different sins. And when God says for us to love each other, he he doesn't put a qualification on that. But I, I, I yeah, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one thing I compare it to, I, I wouldn't even, for me, it works better. And it's not like, I, I think I have established how, what I believe God established, right? I mean, I think I've made clear my perspective on um, marriage and morality. But at the same time, I I wouldn't, I, I would just say we all have different, um, we're all different. We all have different struggles and challenges and, and we're a, a different makeup, right? And God made us all the way we are. And I think that in, in God's perfection and wisdom, right? And so, um, so I just, I really think like, like, I think one of the examples I often use is, I have a lot of children. And um, I, I don't know if we said, but I, I have 13 children that I've given birth to my husband, and I have 13 children, and I have really hard pregnancies, I have bad ADD, I always want to be studying and doing things. And I felt like I was always cleaning my house and it was never clean. It was always a mess. Right. And for a lot of people, cleanliness is next to godliness. So some people would look at me with such harsh judgment, but I was just truly bad that I deserved to be treated with disdain and judgment and, you know, with harshness because I couldn't keep my house up to their standards, you know, that, that, that I struggled with my housekeeping. And and I when I, and I spent so much time praying, like, God, please help me do better. I, like, I felt like such a failure for so long. But yeah. every time I would go to the Lord about it, the Lord would like, like, I, I would find out the next day I was pregnant again, or I would, I would you know, like, I was never told this is what you're here to do. I was always told, I'm here to do other things. And and, and I, so I guess the thing that's interesting to me is for a lot of people, if I want to be a righteous woman, I need to have a clean house, right? That's just how it needs to be. And, and so I guess what I'm saying is the same, uh, that was so not helpful to me to just experience judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was really helpful to me when someone would come and help me, but it wasn't helpful to me at all when they would just judge me. And so I feel the same way. Nobody can understand my walk with God, but me. Right. And, and I, and, and, and I know that when I have fasted and prayed and said, please make this weakness a strength to me, which I've learned means something different than I thought it meant when I just meant make me good at something I'm bad at, you know, mm -hmm. but, and, and I would always receive a different answer. So I knew I was walking with God, even if it didn't look that way to other people. So I, that's kind of how I interpret things like with people who have the tremendous challenge of really struggling with their weight. So we need to point out to them that, you know, you'd really be healthier if you, you know, if you, if you just ate, made some change, right. Is that going to be helpful to them if we just judge them or treat them and say, God hates you because you're, you, you know, like, like you really are sinning. You, you get that you're sinning. Right. And, and so I, I look at all sin the same way. Our gay brothers and sisters don't need us to point out our disapproval. They don't need to hear it from us. Right. We live the way that God tells us to live and the love that radiates out from us can, can inspire others in all of those fields. Right. I know mm -hmm. I struggled with all of these things. I had struggles with my weight, but was seeing somebody else and feeling inspired to ask them that helped me learn better ways that, that work for me to be more healthy and more fit. Right. So if anyone, like anyone that would be like, Hey, my, my dad, my mom used to struggle with her weight. And my dad was, he, he's so cute. He, the way his brain worked, he solved the problem for her. He was like, look, honey, I've solved this for you. And he made a chart. And on one side was the weight. And on the other side was the date. And she could just have the chart on the wall and watch the line come down. Mm -hmm. You know, like she could mark her weight every day. And that's how easy it could be. As long as she had a way to watch the line come down, her weight problem was solved, right? Like, mm -hmm. like if, if it's that yeah. easy, then we would all be fixing everything all the time. So that's my mm -hmm. same. People often will use the phrase, um, the scripture, God can, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance and apply it to things like homosexuality. But completely missing the point. No, 
That means all of us. God cannot look upon sin with the least grain yeah. of allowance. What are you one of the 90 and nine that are in the wilderness that have no need of repentance? Mm. Or are you the one that can recognize that you're lost and that, like King Benjamin's people, I'm less than the dust of the earth. I'm always an unprofitable servant. So that the Lord can take us home. And then when the Lord has done that for us and we feel that love, then we do that for other people. That's the parable of the talents in my interpretation, right? Like, like the more that we are given, the more we are expected to give so that we are a good investment for the Lord. The more he entrusts in us, if he gives us portions of grace, are we going to bury it and say, look, you, I only needed one portion of grace and I buried it. I did it all on my own with my own works. God, here's your grace back. I didn't even need it. What happened to that servant? Whereas someone who needed five portions of grace went out in the marketplace and treated his neighbors with as much grace as he'd been given, right? Who was the pro the more profitable servant to the Lord? Although none of us are profitable, right? So that's what yeah. I think is like, let's not, let's not put different things in different categories and say that sin is the one, that's the bad sin, That right? We just need to love one another and trust God to teach all of us what we need to know instead right. of always having this, like, again, just like, I was talking about how in polygamy, we miss the example of the savior. I think in the broader Christian world, we tend to do that as well. I think all of us need to constantly be refreshing and asking where we fail to see, right? Where we are blind, where we, where we don't hear, where we don't understand in our hearts. Right. Yeah. So that we can keep Amen. getting it better and better. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And we're, we're told to be lights on a hill, like reflecting God's light in the light of Christ, not lasers on a hill, like beaming down and like incinerating everybody who like doesn't measure up in our in our in our eyes or whatever but yeah i I, re I recently listened to this really well it was actually a few months ago but i've recently i've listened to it three times this um really good uh interpretation of of, of the book of Job. but he's he, he goes into this um uh, he's discussing hedonism versus moralism you know the hedonists are the ones who are out like drinking and and living a licentious lifestyle and, and like doing whatever and just kind of letting loose. And then the moralists are the ones who are self-righteous and they don't see their need for God because they're doing it through all, all of their own righteousness and, every, and they're following the rules and everything. And so he talks about how often the hedonists will be more receptive to God, to God, like, like in, in the time of Christ, often the hedonists were the prostitutes and, and whoever were more receptive to Christ's teachings than were the moralists, because like you were talking about with the grace, like, here's your grace, God, I didn't need it. Cause the moralists say, I'm doing all my part. I don't, they don't see their need, their spiritual poverty before, before God and their need to turn to him. And so, yeah, I, I really love what you shared about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love I love that we've gotten to d discuss this whole thing in general. Um, I going back to what you were saying about how the Book of Mormon clarifies what the Bible teaches. I feel like this this whole topic of of pol polygamy is a super good example of that. Like you were talking about, and it made me think of um, uh, Second Nephi chapter three verse what is it uh, verse twelve where it says here I pulled it up. Wherefore the fruit of thy loins shall ripe, meaning the the descendants of, of the Nephites, of Joseph from the Nephites, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write, meaning, you know, the Bible, and that which shall be written by the fruit of thy loins, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah, so the Book of Mormon and the Bible, shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines, and laying down of contentions, and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins." So I, I just feel like this whole discussion has been a really good example of that. Yeah. That's the perfect scripture to wrap this up because that's exactly what the purpose is supposed to be. If we don't twist it, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. we'll come to the book of Mormon and accept it. I, it. It might be the case that people outside of the LDS church have to help people be, be part of the instruments of the hands of God to help people inside the church, read our own scriptures correctly. Because that's that's what we're struggling to do on some of these topics. Mm -hmm. well, I, and I think it both it goes both ways ways definitely. Yeah, yeah it does go both ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this has been really fun, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> and th thanks for being our first person. Obviously, yeah. like we have a little improvement to do, like to to get a little more smooth smooth at doing this. But you're a really easy person to start with because you're, you're just so brilliant and sharp, and we just love everything you've shared with us. It's been a blessing.
Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm excited as can be for what you guys are doing. I'm so glad for this friendship that we've developed and I will be excited to watch where you guys go with all of this. I think, I think it's going to do great things. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks everyone for watching. God bless. Thank you for watching. And thank you, Michelle, for coming onto our channel. Many lives, including ours, have been blessed by the work that she's been doing. I encourage you to go to Michelle's channel, 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy. I also want to extend an invitation to our viewers to go read Jacob 1-3 through in the Book of Mormon. By reading these chapters, we can clearly see that polygamy, pride, and prejudice are all sins that are intimately connected. To end, I just wanted to say how grateful I am that the Book of Mormon clarifies this issue for us. We've had the Book of Mormon for 200 years, and somehow this one chapter has been quite overlooked. We'd love to hear in the comments how the Book of Mormon is bringing you closer to Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he is our hope.